Hi, my name is Jacob Morgan. I am a four-time best-selling author, speaker, and futurist, and I help create organizations where we all genuinely want to show up to work each day and help develop leaders that we all want to work with and for. And on today's show, we're gonna be talking about the notable nine, which are the four mindsets and five skills that you as a leader need to master. And this is according to 140 of the world's top CEOs and a survey of nearly 14,000 employees. So if you wanna become a future ready leader, then make sure to stay tuned. Congratulations, you are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? As a leader, are you truly ready for the future? That's the question. You see, back in 2010, if I were to ask you if you were ready for 2020, I'm guessing at the time you probably would have said yes. And then 2020 hit and you found out that whether you were ready or not, and let's face it, most people weren't. So let me ask you, are you really prepared for the shifts in the workforce, the trends that are arriving that were leading to 2030? Well, stay tuned because that's exactly what we're going to examine on today's show. I'm your host, Dove Baron. I am the Dragonist, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that transforms everything by putting meaning into action. To find out more about me, you can simply go to DoveBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, which is Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how can we bring people together who completely disagree This is exactly what your mind and your soul have been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and oftentimes intense conversations with some of the world's most interesting people, including astronauts, neuroscientists, philosophers, holy people, quantum physicists, skeptics, entrepreneurs, multi-award winning Grammy entertainers, and some folks you might expect to be a-holes and find that they are truly fascinating. Simply go to dovebaron.com and find out how you can sink your teeth into an episode of Curiosity Bites. As always, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into podcasts. And if you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Look, no one has any real way of predicting the future. But if you're willing to pay attention, there are some very clear signposts. The question is, will you pay attention or will you ignore them? As a leader, are you truly ready for the future? Well, stay tuned because that's exactly where we're going with my guest today. My guest on this episode is Jacob Morgan. He is uh, the author of the the book, The Future Leader. Jacob Morgan is a four-time best-selling author, speaker, futurist who explores leadership, employee experience, and of course, the future of work. He is the founder of futureofworkuniversity.com, an online education and training platform, and the Future If, which is a Facebook group that you can be part of. It's a global community of business leaders, authors, and futurists who explore what our future will look like if certain technologies, ideas, approaches, and trends actually happen. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome Full-time Boston Worldwide, Jacob Morgan! Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise. It's good to be here. So where we always like to start the show is in this world where everybody's telling everybody they're an influencer and they've got impact. And I'm talking to influencers and people who have impact who are leaders. I always like to know who's somebody who's had influence on you, had a massive impact on you, some of you shifted your direction of leadership that we might not necessarily think of or not necessarily imagine or maybe not even somebody we know. 
Probably uh, two people come to mind, my dad and my wife. So my dad, when I was younger, would always tell me, be a leader, not a follower. And uh, my wife, because she's always constantly pushing me to try new things, to uh, kind of go beyond my comfort zone and to expand and learn and grow. So I'd say those two people. Well, tell me, tell me, that's the surface of it. Tell me how and why that's had impact on you. I mean, obviously, you live with your wife. She has influence. You, you know, you yes. lived with your dad, I'm assuming. So there was some influence. But how and why did that impact you? Because those are, those are easy statements. Yeah, probably. Well, so starting with my dad, um, because I, I was always a terrible student in school. So I, uh, I was a terrible student in high school and middle school and community college. And I was very much kind of drifting and not knowing what I wanted to do and where I wanted to live. I was just kind of aimlessly floating around. And then, uh, you know, I, I worked hard in college. I went to the University of California, Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that I started realizing, you know, this is the last chance that I have. If, if I don't do well in college and get good grades, nobody's going to want to hire me for that first job. So I kept thinking of my, my dad's mantra of, uh, you know, be a leader, set your own path. Uh, at the time, I lived in Los Angeles, and I, um, after I graduated college, I threw all my clothes in my car and drove to Nor Northern California. And so I took jobs that I wasn't qualified for. I moved into places that I've never that I'd never been to, and I did all of that because I constantly had that mentality of uh, shape your own path, be the be a leader, not a follower. Um, don't do what other people tell you to do, and and really carve out the direction that you want your life to go down. And I, I very very much remembered that um, as I was growing up and as as I was building uh, my own business. Because it's interesting because you said you know you you realized college was your last chance to do well and get a job, but you're not really a big fan of jobs. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I was. You know, I first had my um, uh, when I graduated college. I I wanted to get a job. Yeah, I thought that my career path would be that I would graduate college, I would go work for a, an amazing company, I would go back and get my MBA, and then that I would eventually progressively climb up the corporate ladder and one day become, a, you know, like a, a chief marketing officer of a, a big name brand like IBM or Coca Cola. Right. And, uh, and that did not happen at all. Uh, in <laughs> fact, my first job out of college, I was working for a technology company in Southern California. And when I interviewed, and keep in mind, I have a dual BA, so double major in economics and psychology, and I have an honor, I graduated with honors. So I was expecting that my first job, there's going to be some amazing stuff going on there. They, yeah. would, they, they would look at my resume, they'd say, oh my God, you're, we're so lucky to have you. Uh, so I interviewed for this company and they told me that I'll be doing all these wonderful things, traveling the country, meeting with entrepreneurs, doing all this really cool and impactful stuff. And I said, all right, fine, I'll take the job. And uh, I had a three hour daily commute. Also keep that in mind. So I was driving three hours a day, 15 hours a week in traffic in downtown LA. Couple, uh, the first few months of my job, I was doing data entry and cold calling and PowerPoint presentations. Nothing about what this company promised. <laughs> uh, and the excitement builds. Exactly. And the, the pivotal moment for me was when uh, one of the top executives comes out of his beautiful corner office and he says, Jacob, I got a really important project for you. And I, I got excited. I thought, okay, this is it. I paid my dues. Here it comes. Something great. And so I run over to this executive and I say, yeah, what is it? How, you know, what are we going to do? And he says, I'm late for a meeting. I need you to go down to Starbucks and get me a cup of coffee. Here's 10 bucks. And by the way, you can get yourself a latte as well. And that was a, a, one of the most pivotal moments in my career and in my life, because at that point, I, um, I kind of felt like I got unplugged from the matrix. Like my, my brain just disconnected from this idea of wanting to have a full-time job. And I literally spent the next couple of months while at work. So I would get all my work done and I would have a couple hours every day of just, you know, downtime. Uh, and, you know, during downtime, what do people do at work? They, they go on social media, they, you know, they do whatever. Uh, I was looking at how do you make money online without having to have a, 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 a boss? So I was learning about affiliate marketing. I was learning about search engine optimization. I was learning about all this crazy stuff to try to figure out how can I make money on my own. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of the last full-time jobs I ever had working for anybody else. And it was thanks to that cup of coffee. Otherwise, who knows where I'd be now. I'd still probably be in you know, corporate America, uh, banging my head against the wall. But it's interesting because you were, you know, the advice of your dad was be a leader, not a follower. Yeah. And in many ways, you stepped into being a follower and it took a cup of coffee for you to be a leader of your yep. own life. 
Yeah, no, I, that, cool. that was the problem. I very much was a follower and I subscribed to the traditional idea of if you want to be successful in life, you have to get good grades, you have to get a good job and you have to climb the corporate ladder. And um, that was exactly what I did. You know, I, was, I think that that's great if that's your path and you really want it to be your path, but it's not the only path. And I think that's the lesson for all of us is that we, yeah. we tend to think it's the only path. No, there are many paths. And yeah. that is just one. Yeah, exactly. So. And your wife's, your wife's was trying new things. How's that impacted? <laughs> well, not necessarily. So, uh, well, my mom always said, try new things, uh, you know, try new foods, live in new places, do different things uh, that you haven't done. Um, my wife mainly made me uh, better at everything that I do because she's always pushing me. She's always my support mechanism. Uh, if things aren't going my way, she's always the first one to lift me up. If uh, I have wins, she's always the first one to celebrate them. Uh, so she is very, and I think that's very, very important, especially when you work for yourself, to have somebody there who can help lift you up and who can also celebrate with you. And she does a fantastic job of that always pushing me, encouraging me, trying to get me to go in the right direction. Uh, so she, I think, is, is probably the best uh, spouse, business partner that I could ask for. She also works for herself. So we're both, we're in different niches. So she focuses on customer experience. I focus more on leadership, future of work. But we share a home office. We share this studio. She was up here earlier. Uh, we sit side by side. We have a podcast together. So we spend a lot of time together, probably more than most people would be comfortable with. Yeah, I, um, I really appreciate you sharing that with us, Jacob, because, you know, I have a, my business partner is also my bride um, and has been my business partner for many, many years. Um, and oftentimes I will hear that, well, how can you be business partners? You know, I couldn't think of a better business partner, yeah. but it, but on the, same sort of taking that a little bit further is what you said there, which is that a great business partner, just like a great spouse is both lifting you up and kicking your ass, you know? So, and, and I think that people think it's got, you know, like your wife will drive you mad, you know, i.e. kicking your ass the whole time, but, or she will be blowing smoke up your ass telling you how wonderful you are when, when you really need to be guided and directed and pushed a little more. And, you know, and a great partner in business and in life has got to be both of those things. Like my, as you said, my wife is the first one to cheer me on it with a, with a win. And she's yeah. also the first one to remind me of, Hey, is this how you really want to be in the world? And you mm -hmm. know, do you really, so I, I really appreciate you sharing that with people because I think that oftentimes there's such a disconnect for people with their private life and their, particularly leaders, they hold their private life as separate from their business life. And it's not. Even if you don't work with your partner like we do, um, it's not because if you're, if you're, wherever you go, there you are, as the Buddhists say, you're going to take you with you and you're going to bang into yourself and uh, your shit is going to show up wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, uh, I mean, especially now we, where everybody's being, you know, through these virtual calls that a lot of people are doing, I mean, you're doing them from your living room, your bedroom, your closet, your, your kitchen. Uh, we're letting people into our lives very much. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, I, I can imagine that there was some discomfort and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that when this first started, but now it's very common to have a call with a bunch of executives and your kid is throwing a bouncy ball at your head or people see your messy closet or whatever it is. So it's, um, it, I think it's, it's good for us to be a little bit more authentic and vulnerable with each other. And my wife has a saying, she always tells me, she always says, be where your feet are. So similar to that, uh, that Buddhist saying, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah, exactly. But it, you know, it, it's, it's also a very interesting thing because um, due to the pandemic, we're not physically present with people, yeah. but in many ways we've become more intimate with people. As you said, you know, instead of showing up as the guy with his suit, his beautiful suit and his beautiful tie on, um, you know, you might still have a beautiful suit, and beautiful tie on, as you do your zoom call, but then the kids are screaming in the background that that level of intimacy, I think is part of what I've been talking about as the future of work. Um, because, um, we know the stats are showing that as we're moving forward, there's a very large portion of people who will never return to work in an office full time again, 
not because they get fired, but because they never want to. They, they realize, oh, I don't have to commute three hours a day to LA. I can actually do all this from home. Why would I go in? I could go in once a week, once a month, but I don't really need to go in. Yeah. And I think that that's an interesting piece of that we've become physically distant and it's an opportunity for us to become emotionally closer and as you said, more authentic, more real. I, I wanna get into the details of the future of work and where you, where you went and the future leader in, in a minute, but in the trends of what you've been researching around this, what are you seeing around that remote world and, and where we're going forward? Well, I, so I, I still believe that the majority of people will continue to have regular full-time jobs working from an office. Um, I, at least from what I've seen and from all the business leaders I've interviewed, they, there are certainly organizations like, uh, like Twitter, for example, who are saying if you're in some of these different types of roles, you could work remotely forever, you're going to take a pay cut, you know, stuff like that. So some organizations are doing that. Um, for me, the bigger shift isn't that we're going to have more people working remotely full time, it's that we're going to have more flexible work. And I think there's a difference. Uh, remotely full time means that you, I mean, you can literally live anywhere in the world. You never need to show up to an office. I don't think that's going to be the case for still the vast majority of people in the world. However, what I do think we're going to see much more of is organizations saying, you don't have to be here every day. Um, you don't have to be here on a set schedule. You can have as much flexibility as you want. You can work when, uh, when you want from wherever you want. And there's going to be some guidelines and parameters around that, but I think we're going to shift much more towards a, a flexible work arrangement instead of a purely virtual arrangement. Because we need to remember there's still something to be said for building trust, psychological safety. There's still something to be said for building relationships, for leader. Like a lot of stuff is still, I think, very, very crucial for in person. And so I don't see that disappearing, but I do see organizations being more flexible. And that's by and large what all the business leaders are telling me. In fact, I haven't interviewed a single business leader or CEO yet who said that their plan is to not return to the office and to have a full-time remote organization. Even startups here in the Bay Area where I live, um, they are excited to get people back into the offices, to get people back to work. Is this going to be true for everybody? Of course not. But I still think the vast majority of people around the world will be back in an office. That's, that's interesting. And it's particularly interesting um, in the context of where I wanted to go next, which is, <clears throat> as you know, I also work with leaders and with organizations. And um, what's been clear to me is that what a CEO thinks is happening in a company uh, or even in an industry is often very different than that of the employees. And for your new book, yep. The Future Leader, you interviewed 140 CEOs but you also saw, surveyed, I believe, was it 100, uh, 14,000 employees? Yep. Is that right? Yep, 14,000. Right, 14,000 employees. So that's, that's a different, you know, two very different perspectives. Oh, yeah. How did those two perspectives line up? Because it would be interesting. I know that you did all that before the pandemic, yeah. but it would also be interesting to see that around remote work and how they see that too. Uh, all. Don't give me like, more work, man. Don't give me more work. <laughs> this was hard enough as it was to do, but I, yeah, I wish you, if, um, uh, if the book didn't come out when it did, and let's say the book was coming out later this year, uh, I think it would be very, very interesting to, to, to do something about that. To, to, to Absolutely. Find. And, and who knows, maybe I will do, if I get very ambitious to reach back out to those CEOs and do another survey or something. Um, but to your earlier point, yeah, there's a huge disconnect. And, you know, we always make this joke, right? Um, the executives are in the ivory tower. They're disconnected from the company. We kind of play it off as tongue in cheek. We make fun of it in movies. We make fun of it in cartoons. But there's not oftentimes a lot of data which actually supports it. So mm -hmm. what I did is I tried to go out and collect data to support it. And I looked at a couple different things. I looked at um, uh, trends that are shaping future leaders, the greatest challenges that future leaders need to overcome the most crucial mindsets that future leaders need to have, the most crucial skill sets that future leaders need to have. And just broadly, if organizations have programs and plans in place to address leadership over the coming years. Right, and right. so um, I guess we can, broadly speaking across the board, what a lot of these senior executives and even mid-level managers said is, we're ready for these trends, we are ready for these challenges. We're doing a good job of practicing these mindsets. We're doing a good job of practicing these skills. And yes, we have plans in place to address leadership in the future. 
and then these 14,000 employees, same kind. And again, this is very broadly speaking, 14,000 employees um, who work for these mid and senior executives. Yeah. Same questions. They would say, our mid and senior level leaders are not ready for these trends. Our mid and senior level leaders are not ready for these challenges. Our mid and senior leaders are doing a terrible job of practicing these mindsets and skills. And no, our organization is not ready and is not thinking about leadership over the next few years. So it is almost as 180 as you can get it to be. The mm -hmm. perception of the leaders and the perception of the people who work for these leaders is on polar opposites. Uh, the interesting thing is that this gap also exists not just between leaders and non-leaders, but also between mid-level and senior level leaders. So the more senior you become in a company, the more disconnected you become. And this disconnection exists between leaders themselves, mid and senior, and also the gap exists between non-leaders and leaders. So from a psychological point of view, I certainly have my own theory on why that is. What did you find out about why that is? Well, that's the tough part is to find out why exactly that's the case. And there could be numerous reasons for it. Um, there could be uh, because of a very strict hierarchy and bureaucracy. It could be because of a lack of communication across the board. It could be because, uh, you know, maybe leaders are interested in self-preservation and they're scared and they're just kind of hoarding everything themselves and not sharing things with other people. Uh, there could be numerous reasons. There could be just a general disconnect, uh, just a lack of awareness, lack of perception, um, lack of just understanding between leaders and, and non-leaders. You know, there could be a lot of different reasons for why this is happening. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint, broadly speaking, why this is the case. The, I think the important thing is that this is the case. Yes. The leaders need to be aware of it and do whatever they can to make sure that that gap gets closed. But you just made the point there, Jacob, which is it is the case. Yeah. But what is doesn't mean anybody's doing anything about it. Yep. So, you know, the the leader who is watching, listening to us um, says, oh, wow, okay, that's fascinating. And then goes back to Monday. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating. So what? Um, you know, it, it it's that point of change because, you know, the data is fabulous and it's interesting and, ooh, and it gives us things to talk about. But it's the action taken with that data that matters most. So, you know, how if you're walking into an organization and you're saying there is this huge disconnect between uh, even mid-level management and upper management or between the workforce and, and the other two groups and they go, oh, well, that's interesting. Um, what, how is it, how are you guiding them around? You get, you got to take action, dude. <laughs> like, tch, tch, wakey, wakey. <laughs> yeah, there, um, I think there are a lot of things that organizations can start to do to try to close that gap. Uh, the first thing that a lot of leaders need to realize is that leadership is no longer about them. Leadership is not about you. Uh, so the cover, let me see if I have, so the, for people who can see the cover of the book is a lighthouse. Yes. And that's the analogy that I use in the book is I say, as a leader, your job is to be a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Which means that, of course, you should build yourself up, learn these new skills, learn these new, the new mindsets. But a lighthouse without ships in the water is useless. Mm -hmm. And so why build yourself up to know all these things and to become this great leader if you have nobody to lead? And so leaders need to remember that part of their job is to guide others, to help make other people more successful. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start to close this gap in your company, I think there are a couple of things that you can start to do. Um, number one is you need to have more conversations with your employees. Uh, let them know about, you know, the things that you're doing, how you're implementing these different things. Uh, lead by example. So let's pick a random uh, mindset or skill from the book, emotional intelligence. Don't just talk about emotional intelligence, practice it. Practice empathy, practice self-awareness. Show the people who work for you that you have the mindset of the explorer, meaning you practice curiosity, that you have a growth mindset. So spend a lot more time doing and less time just talking about these things. Uh, and I think being able to have these conversations with employees more frequently, more openly and transparently is a great way to start to close that gap and to actually teach these things inside of your company. Teach other people how to practice emotional intelligence. Teach other people how to be tech savvy and digitally fluent. And that I think is very much going to close that gap. Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, in our work, in our research, uh, you know, we've been talking about this gap 
and you know, and I was saying psychologically why I believe it is there um, is what in what you've just addressed is that <clears throat> you know I will often say to a leader, what's the number one? Or let's say I've got an executive team in front of me, and I'll go around and I'll say to each person, who's the number one person who answers to you? They'll tell me, and I'll say, what's their number one job? And they'll tell me, and I'll say no. And they go, what do you mean? No, that I know what their job is. And I go, no, to them, what is their number one job? And they go, oh, uh, isn't it what I said? No, their number one job to them is to keep you happy because you write the paycheck. You're in charge of whether they have a job next week, next month, next year. And so the problem with that is you immediately have a bias in the information you're receiving. You're never going to get that truth. Yeah. And so until we can really open the lines of communication through, as you said, through emotional intelligence and finding ways to communicate in a really great way with each other, we're going to have yeah. this hierarchy of power that's going to block us from getting to the real truth that we need. We actually need to hear to survive. And, and oftentimes due to a lack of self-awareness, due to a lack of um, emotional intelligence, a leader doesn't even know they're doing it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they know they're blocking it. It's if you're aware, you can do something about it. But if you don't even know, well, it's definitely a problem. <laughs> yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, so um, we're going to take a little break, and we're going to come back in a moment with. with <laughs> sorry, we're going to come back in a moment with Jake Morgan, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the future of work and the future leader. And I want to remind you that this. Uh, episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you by the Dragon's Lair. Have you discovered your next evolution? Imagine being in a virtual classroom where I personally walk you through live trainings where I reveal the techniques, strategies that I previously only offered to top CEOs, C-suite executives, high-level entrepreneurs, athletes, and entertainers. And then being able to, ac to access that training and the, ex and the exclusive workbooks that go on with it on demand. That's what many of our listeners are discovering. Now it's your opportunity to go over to www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Dov Baron. And in just two minutes, you can join us. In fact, you'll even get access to past episodes on subjects like uncovering the, your genius blind spot, ethical persuasion, becoming a meaning-driven leader, resilient leadership in a time of chaos, and so much more. Simply go over to patreon.com forward slash Dov Baron and secure your seat right now. Welcome back. I'm here talking to the author of The Future Leader. And we, we, were, we were talking about what some of the challenges there are. And Jacob Morgan, who is the author, was sharing with us some of the gaps and the discrepancies between not only uh, employees and managers, but even between mid-level managers mm -hmm. and uh, senior executives or senior leaders. So I know that the book was focused on two main questions uh, and i want to start with the first one which is will the leaders of 2030 be different than the leaders of today what did you what did you find out jacob what, what sort of was glaring so the first uh, is of uh, the general consensus is yes that the leader of 2030 will be significantly different than the leader of today uh, and then the, the meat of the book focuses on how that leader will be different by looking at the mindsets and skills. Mm -hmm. But the crazy thing is, as you mentioned, this came out before the pandemic, before right. all this stuff with George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, before all this stuff happened. Right. And so the really fascinating thing has been to see how much the timeline for practicing these skills and mindsets has shrunk. In other words, the future leader is kind of like the present leader now. Because the things yeah. that I talked about in the book were, you know, they were aimed to be looked at the future, but now with what's happening in the world, they need to be implemented immediately in the present. And we're starting to see a lot of organizations do that. There's been a lot of demand for learning these things, uh, learning these things now. Um, so that's been probably one of the most interesting things to see. Um, and so why is leadership going to be different? Well, because you look at the new world that we're all a part of. Mm -hmm. you look at things that are happening with COVID or Black Lives Matter, uh, even broadly speaking, globalization, AI and technology, there's a big shift towards purpose and meaning and transparency. It just the, the world is fundamentally different. And the rationale from these business leaders was that if our organizations are going to look different as a result of these trends, then it stands to reason that we're gonna need leaders who are different to guide different organizations. 
And, yes. and that's, uh, that's very much true. I mean, it, if you think about how most people get put into leadership positions or have been in leadership positions uh, you know, throughout history, you didn't need to be a good leader. You could play office politics. You could bring in a lot of big deals to the company. You could have a friend in a more senior position. You could stay at the company for 10, 20 years. And you would get put into a leadership position regardless of if you actually have the capability to lead. Yes. And the consensus from these business leaders was that that is no longer going to work. Um, unless you fundamentally believe in and practice some of the skills and mindsets in the book, you are not going to be able to kind of sneak your way into these leadership positions. And, and that I think is actually a, a very, very good thing. Uh, one of the most shocking things that I found from the book is that a lot of people get put into leadership positions with no leadership training. Right. So on average, most people become a leader. And by the way, a leader specifically meaning responsible for other people. Yes. Most people get put into a leadership position at some point, their first one, you know, mid, late 20s, early 30s for the first time leaders. Yes. Most people don't actually go through a leadership training or development program until they are at some point in their 40s, uh, maybe late 30s if you're lucky. So there's a gap of around 10 to 15 years from when you become a leader to when you're actually taught how to be a leader, which to me is insane. Um, that's like taking, a, I don't know, Roger Federer or Serena Williams or whoever your favorite athlete is, waiting for them to reach their prime and then saying, hey, now we're going to work on your forehand. Now we're going to work on your jump shot. Why wouldn't you want every single employee in your company to practice these mindsets and skills, to have emotional intelligence, to think like a futurist, to have a, a growth mindset. Like, why wouldn't you want everybody to do these things, not just people in leadership positions? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's insane to me. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, <clears throat> and I, it's one of the reasons that I, I'm very keen on saying that we've got to train leadership at the very front line, as well as the high office. Um, because, as you said, uh, <clears throat> by the time somebody gets into a, um, leadership training, as you said, that's that 10, 15 year gap. And the problem with that is they probably learned leadership from somebody else who didn't have training. And so what they've actually got is a bunch of bad habits that now need to be broken before they can even implement what it is they're yeah. learning in their leadership training. And that's pretty sad. Yeah. Double it ends up costing them a heck of a lot more, costing the company a heck of a lot more. Yeah, and not just in terms of dollars and cents, but also in terms of uh, leading people ineffectively for that period of five to 10 years, what it might do to morale, to engagement, to turnover, all those other things, productivity, innovation, uh, customer experience. Uh, so I think the cost for organizations is actually quite significant. Absolutely. Now in the book, you go into four mindsets and five skills. Yes. Um, could you sort of give us a gloss over each of one of those and then we can maybe come back on one or two of each of them? Yes, yes. So um, there are four mindsets and um, the four mind, and I gave them kind of fun, quirky names so that people could remember them. Sure. Uh, we have the mindset of the explorer, the mindset of the, uh, of the servant, the mindset of the chef, and we have the last mindset, which is uh, that of the explorer. So the mindset, and I'm going to look at my little diagram here so I don't forget. You can do that. Uh, the mindset of the global citizen is about how do you balance, um, well, not balance, but surround yourself by people who are not like you, right. right? Like you, behave like you, act like you, et cetera. And also, how do you have a big picture perspective, not just thinking and seeing what's right in front of you, but kind of, um, you know, you see a chessboard behind me. To yeah. use a, a chess analogy, it's looking at all 64 squares uh, instead of just one part of the chessboard. Uh, that's uh, I take chess lessons with a grandmaster and whenever we're doing chess puzzles, he says, don't just look at where the action is, look at the entire chess board. Mm -hmm. That's part of being a global citizen, looking at the entire chess board and being okay, uh, surrounded by people who are not like you. Um, the mindset of the chef is about balancing two ingredients inside your company, which are, are humanity and technology. So how do you make sure the organization stays human, but at the same time, use as much technology as you can to um, be productive, to be efficient, um, to, to be able to keep up with the overall pace of change. Right. We have the mindset of the servant. And uh, the servant is, it's not just about servant leadership. Servant leadership is a part of the puzzle, but the mindset of the servant means that you have humility and vulnerability. 
And also you learn that you actually serve four groups. You serve your customers, you serve your leaders if you have them, uh, you serve your team, but a lot of people forget this. You also need to serve yourself. Yes. And what I mean when I say serve yourself is practicing self-care. Yes. If you've ever been on a plane, and I, you know, not many of us have these days, but they always say, put your own oxygen mask on first before you help others. Because if you're incapacitated, you can't help others. So as a leader, if you show up to work each day and you're stressed out, burned out, unhappy, whatever it is, exhausted, how can you be there leading other people? You can't. Right. So you need to do whatever you need to do as a leader to make sure that when you show up each day, whether it's in person or virtually, you take care of yourself spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, whatever you got to do. Exercise, meditate, journal, but it's your responsibility to make sure that you take care of yourself so that you can take care of other people as well. So yeah. that's, um, that's the mindset of the, of the servant. And the last one is the mindset of the explorer. The mindset of the explorer is about um, having a sense of curiosity, um, having a growth mindset. In other words, when you see obstacles, you know that they are things to conquer. They're not things that are there to permanently keep you from achieving your goals. Um, so that you, you have to believe that you can become better. You can become more talented. You can excel. You can grow. Mm -hmm. Those with a fixed mindset believe the opposite. Like, I'm as hard as I'm ever going to be. I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, if, if you're a speaker, if you're a writer, I, you know, I'm never going to be a better speaker. I can't write any better. I'm, I'm never going to grow, uh, be, go any farther in my career. That's a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, it also is about agility and, uh, and being nimble too. So those are the mindsets. Mindsets specifically are how you as a leader need to think. So kind of like, uh, you know, if you turn on your, your phone, your computer, whatever it is in the morning, it's got this like boot up program that it does, you know, the startup. Yes. Startup for you as a leader is about these mindsets. This is how you need to start off each day. So obviously I'm applauding and, and, very much in favor of what you're saying there on mindsets. Um, however, I, I want to address one thing in there, uh, Jacob, and that is this. Uh, people with a fixed mindset need to not have a fixed mindset. They need to open up their thinking. They need to, you know, be more open to learning, et cetera, et cetera. But the challenge is they have a fixed mindset. So, when let's say one of our uh, viewers, listeners is a CEO, has a great person uh, on a particular department, but they can see this person isn't going any further because they have a fixed mindset. Yeah. Um, they don't, they're not looking to grow and they have kind of this, well, this is how I do it and I do it well. And I get the numbers and I get the, all those things. And, I'm effective at what I do. What do you, what do you say to that leader? So there, there are a few things and there, uh, there are a lot of people like this, not just leaders, but people in general who Absolutely. Uh, have the mentality of, you know, I am, I am the way I am. Uh, and, and there's nothing you can do to change me. I have self-awareness because I know I'm a jerk. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and you don't even need to be a jerk. You could be no. Who uh, I don't know. You, you people always tell you that you should eat healthy, but you never do. People tell you to stop smoking, but you never do. People tell you that you should be nicer, and you never are. You're kind of like, ah, no, this is how I am. And, um, so part of my my job, my role specifically, is I don't view my role as somebody who has to convince anybody to do anything. Uh, I show the research, I show the stories, I show the examples, and hopefully people will change or organizations will change or leaders will become better. But if um, you can't change somebody who does not want to change. You know, I, I have this uh, with, with friends, with family members as well. Some people are very stubborn and, um, and they refuse to change. Yep. And the, you know, the unfortunate thing is there is that people will change when usually some catastrophe happens or something bad happens. I totally agree. You, don't want to, you don't want to wait for something bad to happen. You don't want to wait for your company to start sinking. You don't want to wait for people to start leaving. You don't want to wait to have physical problems before you realize that you need to change. We saw this firsthand with COVID. Mm -hmm. How many organizations, for example, talked about the importance of putting people first, the importance of having flexible work, 
And they've been trying for 10, 20, 30 years to make these things a reality, and they never could. COVID comes around and guess what? Everybody's trying to do what they were supposed to do over the last 20 years in three months. And a lot of companies struggled. And you saw the companies who didn't um, uh, embrace change earlier, they have to lay off employees, they have to furlough people, uh, people are being let go, uh, the company's productivity is slowing down, they didn't have the tools in place to get employees to work effectively. Meanwhile, you see other organizations and other leaders out there who've been working like this for years. And COVID came about and they were like, yeah, we're good. Right. Uh, we, we have the tools. We've already trained our employees and our leaders on how to lead remotely. They already have these skills, these mindsets. So we have the tools in place. We're, we're good. And so that to me, I think is, is the most crucial lesson for, for, for anyone and any leader is you are selling yourself short if you believe that you cannot change, you are selling yourself short, your employees short and your organization short, if you think you cannot become better, if you think that you cannot improve. Not only that, but you owe it to those around you and to yourself to improve. And what I talk about in the book is I give the 1% a day challenge. And that is sometimes change can be overwhelming. And a lot of people say, oh, I can't do all this. It's good. It's going to take hours a day. I, I got to like rebuild my life. It's too much. I always tell them improve by 1% a day. Mm -hmm. If you can improve by 1% a day, then by the end of the year, you'll be 37 times better. So what does 1% a day look like? It means that as a leader, maybe you spend 15, 20 minutes a day listening to a podcast like this one. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, you practice empathy where when a coworker or uh, a peer comes into your office, you try to put yourself in their shoes and understand their perspective before you respond. Maybe it means that you go out and grab coffee or have a call with somebody on your team who you usually wouldn't talk to. Right. They're um, you know, on a different team. They have a different cultural background. They, you have very opposing views. You keep butting heads. Small things that you can do over time will lead to a great impact. So as a leader and as an individual for that matter, try starting small and see what one small thing can you do a day. And again, really, really small to see what you can do to improve. Um, and once you start, you'll find that those around you will notice change. You will notice change. Your company, your employees, your, your spouse, your significant other, everybody will start to notice this change around you and it will be positive. Mm -hmm. but you don't want to wait for something bad to happen before you realize you need to change. Uh, don't wait for, you know, for, for the fire to be right in front of you um, before you realize, Oh God, I got to get water. I got to, you know, we, <laughs> we got to run. Um, that's not the right way to do it. Yeah. I, I fully agree with you. And unfortunately the psychology of human beings is we, we, we often won't change until there is catastrophe in front of us. Um, and it's one of the things that I've spoken about extensively on, on interviews where I've been on as the guest, which is, you know, COVID has been tragic um, in the loss of life and, and many things. But the truth of the matter is that COVID has pushed us into a future we were resistant to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the old saying is you can't turn a ship on a dime. Well, you know what? They did. Many companies who were multinational went remote in 21 days or they went under and they knew that. And so they made it happen. Yeah. And, and I think that as human beings, we feel like we're ships and we can't turn on a dime. But the truth of the matter is if your, your mom, your wife, your child or yourself got diagnosed with a, with a tragic disease, shit changes pretty fast. Yeah. Suddenly it's like, mm, you know what? I guess I can give up the burgers or I guess I can give up the cigarettes or the alcohol or mm -hmm. the drug or whatever it is. Um, I guess I can, you know, I always say to somebody, if I said to you, can you invest 20 grand today? People would say, you know, the average folk would say probably no. And I go, okay, now if I came to you and said, can you invest 20 grand today? Cause your mom needs it for an immediate surgery. Would you come up with 20 grand? And they go, absolutely. So what's the difference? Yeah. What's the difference is only that you've put that much emergency on it. And it's that level of commitment and emergency that makes things happen. That's what we all forget. And I love that you're driving this home because as you said, the pandemic has taken your book, which is aimed at 2030 and said, ha ha, tricked you. It's 2020. Yeah, it should be titled the book. Um, I should email Wiley about that. And, you know, the interesting thing is that when it comes to change, it's not 
it's not the actual change that people are scared of. In other words, oftentimes when people go through a change, very rarely do they go through the change and then say, oh, I'm worse off. Mm -hmm. Um, People who stop smoking are glad they stopped smoking. People who are eating healthy can't believe the transformation they've gone through. Leaders who practice these skills and mindsets can't believe the results that they have. What people don't like, it's not the change itself, it's the process of change. change. So I heard a great quote. It was, um, um, everybody likes getting to, or everybody likes Disneyland, but nobody likes the drive down there. Right. In other words, like you and I live in Northern California, so Disneyland itself is great, but driving eight hours to get down there is brutal. Nobody right. wants to do that. Right. So I think of that same analogy with change. Um, nobody wants to get to Disneyland, but once they're there, everybody's happy. Yeah. And, and that is, is the interesting thing that people need to remember. It's not the change that you're worried about. It's the process of change. And if you can break down, uh, break down that process and make it small and incremental, then you really have nothing to fear. Absolutely. I love that. So let's do a quick overview of the five skills because you did the four mindsets. So now the yes. five skills that are going to be uh, really vital for a future leader. And, and before you even go into them, the, the question I have for you in context of them is have they also jumped forward in time? Yes. Yes. Right. So Absolutely. tell us what those are. Yeah, the mindsets and skills of both have, have dramatically jumped as far as uh, how crucial they are. Um, so skills are, uh, so mindsets are how you think. Skills are things that you actually need to know how to do. Yes. Yeah. So five skills. And again, this came from the 140 CEOs I interviewed. This isn't stuff I'm making up or, or you know, oh, stuff. come on. It, it, people got it. <laughs> you know how many books and how much stuff is floating around out there where it's like, oh, you know, I, you know, I saw this leader doing this or here's a great story about this company and then it becomes a book. Um, and it's, it's very, it's based on one leader, one company. So this is kind of the, the totality of 140 of the world's top CEOs. Um, so five skills are the coach, the futurist, the technology teenager, um, the translator, and Yoda. Um, Yoda is everybody's favorite one. I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll like Yoda too. Um, yes, I'm a so, fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's start off with the first one, which is uh, the skill of the coach. The skill of the coach is pretty much what it sounds like, but with a little twist. A lot of people think that the role of a coach is, uh, or the role of a leader uh, as a coach is to help make other people more successful. That is a part of the picture, but I want to encourage people to add two words to the end of that. Make people more successful than you. Because helping make somebody else more successful is easy. You could spend five minutes with them, 10 minutes with them, and they're a little teensy bit more successful. And you could say, ah, look what a great leader I am. Joe or Erica is a little bit more successful because of me. That's easy. But as a leader, if you can help make somebody else more successful than you, I mean, think about how much effort, time, resources, commitment, dedication that's going to take from you to help make those around you more successful. So it's very crucial for you as a leader to add that than you uh, to the end of that sentence. The other thing that's crucial about the coach mentality is that um, it's this belief that your job as a leader is to make other leaders. And if you don't believe this, at least do it in the interest of self-preservation. Because what's going to happen, and we're already starting to see this now, I think a leader's job, very high level and broadly speaking, is broken down into two buckets. The first is you make decisions because you have access to more information, you're higher up on the you know, food chain, so to speak, and, and you make decisions. And the second job of a leader, again, very high level, is you get people to move in that direction, move, the people, uh, move people in the direction of that decision. Right. So those are kind of the two big, big things that a leader does. Now, we're already starting to see the influx of technology, AI, and automation, which is going to help augment, uh, augment a lot of the decision-making aspect from leaders. Yep. As a leader, if all you do is tell other people what to do, and if technology is going to help augment some of that decision-making, then your value as a leader decreases dramatically. Yes. But if you're a great leader who also focuses on the human aspect of getting people to become more successful, now your value to the organization increases tenfold because mm-hmm. that is something that very few people can do. Yes. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the coach. The next is the futurist. The futurist was actually ranked as the number one skill uh, by these CEOs for future leaders. The skill of the futurist means that, again, going back to the, uh, the chessboard analogy back there, is that you're not predicting the future, but you are good in terms of um, thinking in terms of scenarios and possibilities. So during a game of chess, 
Um, there are a lot of different, there are more possible moves that can be played in a game of chess than there are atoms in the universe. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Anybody could look it up. Um, so it's a virtually infinite game. And what a lot of great grandmasters do is when they play the game of chess, you don't view the game as like, I'm going to move my pawn, my opponent is going to move their pawn, then I'm going to move my knight, my opponent will move their bishop. That's very singular and it's very much a, a finite path. But what top grandmasters do is they say, well, I can move my pawn and after I move my pawn, my opponent can respond in several different ways. They might move their bishop, they might move their knight, they might try to break in the center, and I need to have some sort of a response or a plan for each one of those things if they happen. That's what the skill of the futurist means, is that as a leader, you are good at thinking in terms of those different um, scenarios and possibilities instead of just picking one path and assuming that that's the path that's going to happen. Um, so that's a very crucial skill. And next, we have the skill of the technology teenager. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you know, whenever we have issues with technology, who do we always turn to? We turn to the kids. Right. It's not because the kids are coders or because they're necessarily developers. They're just tech savvy. They're digitally it's familiar. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I have a four-year-old now. She, she uh, you know, you can give her my, my iPhone. She's turning things on. She can, she can find things on there. I mean, she's becoming very, very um, adept at technology at such a yeah. young age. So as a leader, it means that you need to have that tech savvy, that digital fluentness, that the, the, the comfort level of just playing, tinkering, experimenting with technology um, the same way that kids do. Next, we have the skill of the translator. And the skill of the translator is about listening and communication. Now I know two things that have been around for many, many decades but also two things that are changing more now than they ever have before, both in terms of the number of tools and channels we have to use to listen and to communicate, and also with the difficulty level of listening and communication. I mean, today, how hard is it? You know, you're in a meeting, everyone's got their, uh, you know, their, their phone out in front of you. I mean, Im imagine if we were doing this interview and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's good. I'm sorry, what? I mean, this is how a lot of people run their lives, right? You, you go to dinner with your phone. You, it's, it's very, very hard for people to listen and to communicate. And yes. there's, it's no wonder that they say there's no greater sign of love and respect that you can show somebody than by truly listening to them. Mm -hmm. Listening and hearing are not the same thing, which is no. one distinction I want to make. Hearing is the unconscious act of letting sound enter your ear. Listening is about putting away distractions. It's looking somebody in the eye. It's looking at paying attention to your body language, making the conversation feel collaborative, letting the other person know that you're truly there. And as a leader, this is especially crucial because imagine, and I've seen this firsthand and I experienced this firsthand, when you go to a leader for something, let's say you want help. Uh, you know, you're struggling with something, you want guidance. Yes. Imagine for a minute you go to a leader and you say, look, I, I really need your help with this. I, I need your guidance. What, what should I do? And you can tell that your leader is not truly listening to you. Mm -hmm. um, how does that make you feel while they, you know, maybe they're on their phone while they're trying to interact with you. Maybe you can tell that their mind is drifting off somewhere and they're not really giving you all of themselves to answer your question. As an employee working for that leader, it crushes you. It yeah. crushes your morale, your spirit, your engagement level, and you're not going to want to go back to that leader for anything ever again. No. And so you really, and what kills me is that this is, not a hard thing for us to do. Um, when you are engaging with your employees, pretend like you are talking with your spouse. Pretend like you're talking with a best friend. Would you, or, or your parents, mm -hmm. would you do that to your parents? Would you do that to somebody that you truly care about and love or admire or respect? Probably not. And so you need to treat your employees the same way. Um, and the last skill is the skill of Yoda, which is about emotional intelligence, specifically two components, empathy and self-awareness. Empathy is about putting yourself into somebody else's shoes, understanding their perspective. And self-awareness is understanding um, who you are, your strengths, your weaknesses, but also understanding how other people around you perceive you. So those are the, uh, the five skills of the future leader. Fantastic. We've covered a lot in this show. Um, and you know, one of the questions that I really want to ask you here <clears throat> as we sort of even come to the end is, you know, in all that research that you did, 140, uh, CEOs, 14,000 employees, you, uh, 
prior to COVID were traveling around the world and, and speaking in different organizations. Good old days. Yeah, the good old days. We all remember those. Um, me too. <clears throat> um, is there a company um, who are really integrating what you've laid out in the book really well that you go, wow, I mean, this is, this, this company personifies what it is I've been talking about. I, I think there are a few organizations out there that have been doing a pretty good job of this. Um, so I always think of, of Cisco as one of those organizations. Really? One of, oh yeah, they're one of the companies that I've talked about uh, for many years. They were, they were embracing a lot of these concepts and components well before COVID. Uh, in fact, the first time I, I interviewed Francine Katsudis, their chief people officer was, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. And even then she was telling me about how they are putting their people first, how they're getting rid of annual engagement and performance reviews, how they're connecting everybody with technology, like all the different things that they're going, uh, that they're going through. Um, so I very much think of, of Cisco, I think of a Microsoft, I think they're doing a tremendous job. Uh, with Satya Nadella as their leader. They've been doing some great things. Uh, we've also been hearing a lot of stories of organizations like um, uh, JP Morgan Chase, uh, even, even small businesses. I mean, there's a waffle shop um, that's four or five miles away from me called uh, Oli's Waffle Shop. And I, I love telling this story because it's, it's local and it's maybe more relatable to some non-huge companies. But uh, the, the owners, husband and wife team, they were getting ready to retire before COVID and they bought a beautiful piece of land in Petaluma, $400,000. And they were getting ready to retire to build their dream house over there. Mm -hmm. and then COVID hit. And this is the type of organization where when you walk into one of their restaurants, you see pictures of the employees who work there lying along the walls. And they have this very much, uh, this culture and the belief that we would not be here as a business if it weren't for our people. Wow. And a lot of, um, we hear a lot about this mentality of lead by putting people first, but what does that actually mean? So what happened during COVID, um, they saw that a lot of their employees were not able to make ends meet. And they saw that, um, you know, what are we going to do? We have to close the restaurant. The employees can't work here. And a lot of them can't afford to live. Right. They sold their land where they were planning to retire and build their dream house. They put all of that money back into the business to pay for their employees. They gave up on their dream so that they could help make other people's dreams come true by um, giving them the quality of life that, that they need to have to survive because they knew that their employees have kids, uh, they have families, and that they would have never even gotten into that position if it weren't for them, uh, for their employees. And this is small company, 40 people. And what's crazy is you hear stories about this, you know, all these waffle shop, 40 people. And then you hear other stories of organizations who are letting go of 10,000 employees, 5,000 employees. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, like, are these organizations really doing everything that they can? If there is a waffle shop with a husband and wife team who are willing to make sacrifice so that other people can survive and grow and thrive, are you really telling me that your multi-billion dollar company has to let go of thousands of employees? Are, there, are you as a leader, are your leaders not able to make sacrifices in other areas or personally so that you can take care of the, of, of the other people around you? And it just really makes me wonder. And this is, um, you know, I think a lot of people are becoming very disenfranchised with, the, with corporate America, with uh, just corporations in general, because they're realizing that the only job security that exists nowadays is the one that you can create for yourself. Absolutely. And as much as I um, <clears throat> admire some organizations out there like um, Microsoft, like Cisco, I think even LinkedIn has been doing a good job. Facebook, um, Taylor Morrison, which is a home building company, I think has been doing a great job. There are some fantastic organizations out there and amazing leaders. The problem is we don't have enough of them. Yeah, I And I mean, even today, uh, you know, I woke up this morning, there was somebody um, put a sign on my door and it said, um, uh, you know, I lost my job due to COVID, but uh, I'm a trained pastry chef. And now I'm going to go off on my own and I'm going to open up my kitchen and I'm going to start making pastries. And here's a list of pastries that I can make for you. And she put these signs on all the doors in, in the community that I live. And it's the resiliency of people, I think, is giving me a lot of, a lot of hope to yeah, see that people are um, taking things into their own hands and realizing that just in general, nobody's going to look out for you but you 
So you need to create the life and the security for yourself that you want to have. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great place to finish because uh, <clears throat> the need for lead us to, to not only intellectually know that we need to be better humans as leaders, but we actually have to have greater levels of humanity as yeah. leaders is vital. And what I know is, uh, and I spoke a lot about this way back, which was the recession was the birth, the 2008 recession was the birth of entrepreneurship in a way it had never been before. And COVID will make that look like a blip. Yeah. Because people are like, you know, I cannot trust a company. I thought I could, I can't. And that's, you know, that's what I wrote about in my last book, that people stop trusting companies because of the recession. They put 15, 20 years into a company, recession came and they got thrown out with the trash. And yeah. now they've reinvested in the companies and said, oh my God, it's the same again. And it's going to be a massive birth of entrepreneurship, which is going to be great. But the, the, the companies that will survive will have to be better at being human. Yeah. Jacob, this has been a fabulous conversation. I really want to thank you for all that you've shared. I would love for you to tell our, our listeners and our viewers where they can find out more about you and all your wonderful resources. And of course, about the book. So I am uh, very easy to find. If people want to get uh, in touch with me, they can go to thefutureorganization.com. That's, uh, that's my personal website. Uh, for people who want to get a PDF, for example, of all these skills and mindsets and quotes from the CEOs, uh, we put together a URL called theleadershipdigest.com. That's theleadershipdigest.com. And uh, my email, if anybody wants it, is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Oh, well, you're as crazy as me. You give your email out. Yeah, why not? You know, I love interacting with people, getting questions. Um, as I'm sure you know, when you work for yourself and you're doing what you love and people ask you stuff, I mean, it's, um, I, I, I enjoy it, so. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Jacob, it's been a pleasure and honor, sir. I thank you. I appreciate all that you've shared. It's incredibly valuable, and I really hope that you, dear listener, will take what you've heard and put it in action. Remember that information uh, without application is worth about the same as a hole in a donut because transformation comes from application. Remember, you can hang out with other conscious leaders and you can chat about this episode or any past episodes by going either to our Facebook or our LinkedIn groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. You see, it doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, you're only working a fraction of your true capability. To find out how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker or a leadership strategist or an executive coach for you or your organization, go to dovebaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. Because unified meaning, or as we like to call it, finding a dragon fire is the single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for all individuals and companies. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everyone you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about whether you have the mindsets and the skills to truly be a future leader because the future is already here. I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your dragon fire to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.